If you're interested in history, especially the history of the Middle East, you've probably heard about the Abbasid Caliphate. They were the successor state to the Umayyad dynasty, which basically ruled these lands. Abbasids were a vast Muslim state. They are mostly famous with their Islamic Golden Age, where science, literature, arts and culture flourished with the economy of the Muslim world. The House of Wisdom, which was based in the capital of Baghdad, housed the most brilliant and bright scholars. First, I want to take you on a journey to understand how did the Abbasids came into power in the first place. During the last years of the Rashidun Caliphate, a civil war ensued between a man called Muawiyah and Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law, Ali ibn Abu Talib, for the succession of the Caliphate. After a series of battles and political maneuvers, Muawiyah came victorious and established his own dynasty, known as the Umayyads. Successors of Ali ibn Abu Talib after his assassination continued to live in the Islamic world, pining their own branches of Islam and dividing the Islamic world between the Shiites and the Sunnis. Of course, this matter itself is a whole topic that deserves a whole video of its own, but for the video's sake, I tried to simplify it. Umayyad dynasty would extend the Islamic world's borders from Central Asia to as far as Iberia, ruling from their capital of Damascus, until the Abbasid Revolution. The Abbasids were descendants of the Prophet Muhammad's family. They were known as the Hashemites. Their claim and legitimacy was strong and they had many support from the Muslim realm. The Abbasid banners were all black and message that they tried to give with their all black banners was simple. Just as the clouds covered the earth, the Abbasid movement would one day rule the wide lands. And just as the shadows always exist, an Abbasid Caliph would always lead it. The Abbasid revolution was not a simple coup d'etat led by one ruling elite against another. It was rather an attempt to reconstruct the Islamic world, integrating the rulers and the rule in the society with the leadership of Prophet Muhammad's descendants. The Abbasid revolution gained popularity in the Muslim world, especially by the non-Arabs, unlike Umayyad dynasty, whom depended on Arab-speaking soldiers and statesmen. Within the Abbasid ranks, there were soldiers from faraway provinces or from the frontier regions, like Khurasan. The people of Khurasan had grievances against the Umayyad dynasty for a very long time. They were being ruled by an alien governor sent by Damascus for a very long time. The story of the Abbasid revolution is deeply connected with the lands of Khurasan, thanks to the role it played as the base of opposition. The war between the Abbasids and the Umayyads raged for almost four years. Abbasids overthrew the Umayyad Caliph and the rest of the Umayyad family escaped to Iberia, which they would establish a new state later known as Al-Andalusia. The key to Abbasid's success was to leave eastern Iran in the hands of the Khurasaniyya, the man from Khurasan, who had made up the Abbasid's forces, while establishing the members of the Abbasid family as commanders of armies and governors of provinces in Iraq, Syria, Egypt and Arabian Peninsula. Now I want to take your attention from the armies of the Abbasids and political maneuvers. I want to take you to the city of Badat. The first venture of the new regime was to build a new capital. From the ancient time, Middle Eastern rulers would always build new cities for their armies and administrative staff as a symbol of a new order coming into place. The rulers of the Assyrian Empire created the famous cities of Nineveh and Nimrud. The Sasanians founded Tesiphon. In a strategic location on the main routes between Iraq, Iran and Syria, in one of the most fertile parts of Iraq with easy access to the Tigris-Euphrates water system, the Abbasids built Baghdad to be their new palace and administrative base. Baghdad rapidly exceeded the intentions of its own founders. It grew from a military and administrative base to a major city. The very decision to build the administrative center called the City of Peace, Madinat al-Salam, generated two large settlements in the radius. One was the extensive camp of the Abbasid army in the districts to the north of the palace complex, and the other, to the south, was inhabited by thousands of construction workers brought from Iraq, Syria, Egypt and Iran. Here were the markets to supply the construction workers and their families. Workshops to produce clothes, tools and construction materials continued the projects within the city. The original Badat was a three-part complex. The troop settlement in Al-Harbiya, the working population in Al-Harq and administrative city itself, Madinat Al-Salam. In its time, Badat was the largest city in the world, outside of China. Apart from being the empire's capital, Baghdad became a major commercial center for international trade and many other services. Soldiers and officers, workers that have built the city itself, people from different ethnicities and minorities, merchants from faraway lands, people from India and Iran and faraway lands seeking intellectual contacts all made Baghdad their home. Baghdad then was the product of upheavals, population movements, economic changes. It was the home of the new Middle Eastern society, 
diverse and cosmopolitan, embracing numerous Arab and non-Arab elements, met together into a single society under the protection of the Islamic Empire. It provided the wealth and the manpower to govern a vast empire. It crystallized the Islamic society, which became the golden age of the Abbasids. It provided the manpower and the wealth to govern a vast empire. It crystallized the culture that was going to be identified as the Islamic civilization. The creation of Baghdad was an Abbasid strategy to cope with the mistakes that the Umayyad dynasty had made. The Abbasids had to build effective governing institutions. They had to mobilize political support from Arab Muslims, non-Muslims, converts, people that have paid the empire's taxes. The new dynasty had to secure the loyalty and the obedience of its own subjects. But unfortunately, every order has an end. See, countries are like humans. They grow up, they became old, and they die. So how did the Abbasids come to an end? You see, in history, it's very difficult to give one simple answer when explaining the downfall of civilizations because there is never a one simple answer. There's multiple reasons why a civilization collapses. I will try to reveal some of the reasons why Abbasid Caliphate came to an end in this video. Fast forwarding to the seventh Caliph Al-Ma'mun. This man got the throne from his half-brother after a civil war, followed by rebellions that was led by strong local rulers that gained power over the years. To solve the issues of internal conflicts, Al-Ma'mun adopted a new military policy. Basically, to win the control of the state, he used armies, just like any reasonable man would do. But these armies were not from the Arab-speaking lands. They were from faraway frontier provinces like Khorasan. Al-Ma'mun decided that he should depend on the Khurasanian lord Tahir and his armies. In return, Tahir would be the governor of Khurasan and the general of the Abbasid army throughout the empire. His heirs would inherit the positions that he secured for himself. Win-win. From this point onwards, the Arab component of the military had disappeared. The more experienced and battle-hardened frontier warriors that fought on horsebacks were now the backbone of the Abbasid army. So now the local rulers are jealous of the caliph's new amazing army. They want some for themselves. So they purchased these warriors from the frontier regions or sometimes they captured men to fight for themselves as slave soldiers. They were then grouped into regiments. For the sake of the efficiency and the morale of the regiments, they would live in their own neighborhoods. They had their own mosque, they had their own bazaar. They were paid and trained and supplied by their commanders, not the caliph. Thus, the slave soldier regiments would have their loyalty to their own commanders, not the caliph himself. After Al-Ma'mun, his son Al-Mutasim decided to build a new city for his armies to separate them from the masses of Baghdad. The city of Samarra was built in the northern Iraq and was used as a new capital of the empire. Baghdad still remained the cultural and commercial capital, but Samarra was the military and administrative capital of the empire. Around the empire, caliph and local rulers alike all had slave armies, which separated the caliph from the population that he ruled. In the late years of the Abbasids, whenever the treasury couldn't bear the expenses of its own soldiers, the caliphs would rely on the soldiers of the local rulers, which was happening very often in the late years, because the economic decline of Iraq and Syria around those times just begun. The collection of taxes were becoming more of a problem. Local rulers would not send the tax they owed to the capital sometimes, they would keep it for themselves, to buy slave soldiers, or sometimes they would pay for people that produced art. In the same period, changes in the administrative organization also reduced the capacity of the central government to control the empire. These changes in administration were due partly to the interference of the army and partly to the rise of independent provincial powers. But they were also due to overwhelming stresses in the normal operation of the bureaucracy. In a Basset government, all high-ranking officers employed their personal followers to do their staff work. To learn the art of being the accountant or scribe, a young man had to enter the service of a master, live in his household, and become a dedicated personal servant. He owed his master respect and obedience for life, and the master was obliged not only to train him, but to protect him and advance his career. In time, the bureaucracy came to be dominated by groups and factions whose main interests was to exploit bureaucratic office for private gain. The bureaucracy basically stopped to serve the interests of the ruler and the empire and began to act on behalf of the personal and factional interests. With the decline of military and financial capacities of a central government, provinces became semi-independent. The provinces governed by local rulers freed themselves from the capital, and many of the core provinces that was administrated by Baghdad itself was now territories of a semi-independent rulers around the region. From here onwards, it went downhill. From left and right, local rulers gained power and basically ruled as independent. 
most notably in the regions of Egypt and Persia. Egypt, for example, came under the control of the Tulunid dynasty. The founder of the dynasty, Ahmad Tulun, was originally a sub-governor of Egypt. He built up a private slave army, seized control of Egypt's finances, and established his own dynasty. In other areas, didn't obey the orders of the central government. Some stopped sending tax revenues, others negotiated a fixed payment in return for their assignments. Despite the loss of control of Egypt and Iran, the caliphate was not totally lost. The caliphs managed to defeat the Tulunids in Egypt and many other local rulers around Syria and Persia, and they would restore order again. But this order would not live long. With the bureaucracy in disarray, the caliph could not use the temporary military victories to reorganize the empire. Looking to the borders of the Abbasid Caliphate, there were two more caliphs in the world that were not in Baghdad. In the following years, the Iberian Muslim rulers proclaimed themselves as caliphs. Apart from Iberians, Shiite branch of Islam were gaining much popularity around the Muslim world and in Egypt. The Fatimids already asserted their own power and proclaimed themselves as caliphs. This debased the authority of the caliph in Baghdad in a religious matters. It's sad to talk about how Abbasids lost everything, but decline and collapse is not always something really bad. There are historians that talk about how Abbasid Caliph's downfall led to the Islamic Renaissance. It sounds a bit weird, but hear me out. Baghdad was a center of knowledge and art thanks to the employment of scholars and artists in the House of Wisdom. Gathering an immense library was very expensive at the time, and now the local rulers had this same amount of wealth to build their own libraries. Baghdad remained very important, but it was not the center of knowledge anymore. Many scholars traveled freely to the other places and spread their knowledge. The conversion of the majority of the population to Islam and the growing division between Sunni and Shi'i Islam gave rise to important theological writing and debates. With the rise of local rulers and semi-independent rulers around the Abbasid Caliphate, Muslim world did not have a main center of metropolis to look up to, but it was a whole galaxy of regional centers, each developing its own political society and cultures. Abbasids would lose their power with the rise of the Buyid dynasty of Iran and the coming of Seljuk Turks. The reasons that led to the decline of Abbasids would build and inspire the successors of the Abbasids. The system of recruiting, training, and employing slave soldiers was a major innovation in the Middle Eastern history and the beginning of an institution that would characterize many later Muslim regimes. The military and political need for loyal troops directed the attention of the caliphs to long-established employment of military forces from frontier regions and marginal populations, just like the Romans, whom recruited Illyrians and Germans to their armies. Since the Umayyad times, the caliphs and the governors of an Arab Muslim empire would raise troops from the eastern Iran, and they would even get their own personal bodyguards, consisting of the slave soldiers. The Ayyubids would install the Mamluk slave soldiers. The Ottomans would find a whole organization and system called Devshirme, to train gunpowder soldiers called Janissaries, and sometimes they would train them even to be high-ranking officials around the empire. Thus, the breakup of the Abbasid Empire was at once a political, social, and an economic transformation. The bureaucratic and small landowning elites who favored centralized government were replaced by large-scale landowners and military lords who opposed it. The overall decline of the economy further contributed to the weakening of the empire, Finally, the military, administrative, and cultural policies of the empire themselves led to its collapse. After the Abbasids, the Middle East would be basically an Islamic commonwealth that shared the same religion but different ways of producing art.